First, we'll talk about GLP-1 receptor agonists and the current clinical guidelines around their use in management of type 2 diabetes. In 2019, the American Diabetes Association published a fundamentally new treatment algorithm. It held that the first-line therapy for type 2 diabetes is generally metformin, absent contraindications or intolerance, combined with comprehensive lifestyle modification. And the notion is if the hemoglobin A1C remains above the target that's individualized for a patient, that you would proceed through the algorithm. The key branch point and the first consideration in treatment decisions in diabetes is does the patient have established atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease or chronic kidney disease? If the patient has atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease, and it's the vascular disease itself that predominates in the clinical situation, patients with recurrent episodes of angina, recurrent stents, that kind of presentation, the suggestion is to use a GLP-1 receptor agonist with proven cardiovascular benefit or an SGLT2 inhibitor similarly with proven cardiovascular benefit if the estimated glomerular filtration rate is adequate. On the other hand, if the patient has heart failure or chronic kidney disease, and that's the predominant condition for the patient, the recommendation is to start with an SGLT2 inhibitor with evidence of reduction of heart failure or chronic kidney disease progression assuming that the estimated glomerular filtration rate is adequate, and only if the SGLT2 inhibitor is not tolerated or contraindicated, or if the EGFR is less inadequate, then you would use a GLP-1 receptor agonist with proven cardiovascular benefit. If patients don't have established atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease or chronic kidney disease, then you have a variety of different compelling needs that are suggested to review with patients. The first would be a compelling need to minimize hypoglycemia, and there, GLP-1 receptor agonists are one of the recommended options, along with DPP-4 inhibitors, SGLT2 inhibitors, and thiazoldine dienes. A second situation is a compelling need to minimize weight gain or promote weight loss. Again, GLP-1 receptor agonists with good efficacy for weight loss or an SGLT2 inhibitor would be appropriate. And lastly, if cost is a major issue, this is the one area where these newer agents, GLP-1 receptor agonists and SGLT2 inhibitors, are quite pricey. And there, the suggestion is that sulfonylureas and thiazoldine dienes that are generic and generally relatively inexpensive would be the way to go. There are a number of resources that we can use to try and find methods to reduce the medication costs for patients. One example is using formulary lookup tools. These are generally web-based applications that you can have on your phone or look on the desktop computer in your exam room that allow you to establish what is the optimal coverage for a particular class of drugs or a range of treatments for patients with diabetes. And I personally use the formulary search app, which is quite easy to use. There's also pricing tools that will help you determine, are there special deals? And what is the actual cost for getting a prescription at particular pharmacies at a particular zip code? And this GoodRx application is a good example of that. And it's something that I actually encourage patients to get because often the best deal varies from month to month, even day to day. And then there are a variety of medication access programs that provide mechanisms for patients to get medications at reduced costs and sometimes even for free. In patients that need the additional efficacy of injectable therapy, another aspect of this recent American Diabetes Association guidance is that the GLP-1 receptor agonists are prioritized as the first recommended injectable agent ahead of insulin. The algorithm holds that if the hemoglobin A1c is above the individualized target, despite two or three generally oral agent therapies, that you consider GLP-1 receptor agonists as the next step in most prior to insulin. 
if the A1C remains above target, the idea would be then to add basal insulin. The caveats around when you would consider insulin as the first injectable would be first, if the hemoglobin A1C is very high, and particularly in the setting of patients with symptoms or evidence of catabolism like weight loss. And the reason is because, remember, 5% of patients with adult-onset diabetes actually have type 1 diabetes, and it's often relatively hard to distinguish. In patients that are having weight loss or other symptoms or evidence of catabolism, it's quite possible they have type 1 diabetes, and insulin would clearly be the drug of choice in that setting. Also, if the hemoglobin A1c is greater than 10%, you might want to think about using the combination injectable agents. There are fixed ratio combinations of GLP-1 receptor agonists with insulin that have unparalleled efficacy with regards to glucose reduction and would be appropriate in patients with very high hemoglobin A1c's. And each of these options have specific recommendations around the doses for initiation and the process for titration, and that's available from the American Diabetes Association. The American Association of Clinical Endocrinologists likewise have guidelines, and their guidelines hold that if the A1C is less than 7.5%, so the ACE goal of a hemoglobin A1C in general of less than 6.5%, would be reachable with a single drug therapy, the recommendation is to consider metformin, GLP-1 receptor agonists, SGLT2 inhibitors, DPP-4 inhibitors, thiazoldine diones, or sulfonylureas, and they pretty much recommend them in that order. If the A1C is greater than or equal to 7.5%, the rationale is that patients probably will need two drugs eventually. They may even need three. And with progressively higher hemoglobin A1C, the recommendation is to start two drugs, or even in some cases, three drugs at the same time. The general agents recommended are similar. They add basal insulin to the mix. They are ranked, and both in the setting of dual therapy and triple therapy, GLP-1 receptor agonists are at the top of the list, again, because these agents have remarkable glycemic efficacy. If the A1C is greater than 9%, and particularly if patients have symptoms, the recommended therapy is insulin. Again, for the same kind of rationale that we spoke about earlier, that patients may have type 1 diabetes, and in that setting, insulin is really the only therapy. The American College of Cardiology had an expert consensus publication in 2018 on patients who had type 2 diabetes as well as comorbid atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease. And the major emphasis is to address two issues concurrently. First, guideline-directed medical therapy aimed at improving lifestyle, thrombosis, blood pressure, and lipids, as well as glucose-lowering therapy, specifically metformin, and considering the addition of an SGLT2 inhibitor or a GLP-1 receptor agonist with demonstrated cardiovascular outcome benefit in patients with type 2 diabetes and established clinical atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease. They also point out that this has to be part of a shared decision-making process between the patient and the clinician. These agents all have specific attributes that would recommend them more for one patient or another, and there are barriers, as we discussed earlier, particularly financial barriers to using them. So a shared decision-making process is important. Major adverse cardiovascular events are the leading causes of death in patients with type 2 diabetes. And in a recent randomized trial for a DPP-4 inhibitor, what we found was that in patients who at baseline were over the age of 50, had type 2 diabetes and established atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease with hemoglobin A1Cs between 6.5 and 8% on 1 to 2 oral glucose lowering meds without advanced chronic kidney disease, nearly 50% of the deaths in the trial were cardiovascular deaths.
when you break down the cardiovascular deaths, the single largest identified cause or syndrome is that of sudden death, which really highlights the need for aggressive risk factor management in these patients because often patients don't get a second chance to think about advancing their cardiovascular risk reduction therapy. Acute myocardial infarction and stroke is second on the list, and then heart failure death, third on the list uh, in this specific study. Now, always cardiovascular death is something that is presumed to have occurred when there is no other identified cause. So, as an example, a patient who didn't make it to the hospital was found dead at home or died at work. There, in the absence of some other known cause, it's identified as presumed cardiovascular death. Despite the knowledge about the importance of cardiovascular disease to both morbidity and mortality in patients with type 2 diabetes, cardiovascular risk factor control remains somewhat problematic. The NHANES study is a long-term nationwide population-based survey where patients are identified or self-identified as having diabetes or not, and those patients who say they don't have diabetes are actually tested to determine whether they do have diabetes. And if you look at the patients who have diabetes in the NHANE study, about 85% of them are not smoking. That's great. Only 56% have an A1C in the, quote, control range, which for this study was identified as an A1C less than 7 for patients without cardiovascular disease and less than 8 for patients with cardiovascular disease. So even using a relatively loose definition, it's only 56% have achieved A1C control. Almost more disturbing, it's only about 50% that have achieved blood pressure or LDL targets. And as we all recognize, most patients with diabetes have BMIs well in excess of what would be considered healthful. And then when you look at the composite of achieving the A1C blood pressure and LDL cholesterol recommended therapies, it's only about 17% of patients who have all three of those ABC risk factors controlled. I've mentioned before, but I'll say again, there are many therapeutic benefits to GLP-1 receptor agonists in type 2 diabetes. Arguably, these agents are the most effective glucose-lowering therapies. There's a bit of a debate whether that's really insulin or GLP-1 receptor agonists. I would just point out that in head-to-head -head trials, in general, the long-acting GLP-1 receptor agonists have provided at least as good and more often than not better A1C lowering of efficacy. So arguably, GLP-1 receptor agonists are not only high efficacy, but arguably the highest efficacy glucose lowering agents. They're associated with weight loss. In general, on average, two to three kilograms, but obviously some patients lose a great deal more weight, and that is really transformational for those individuals. Unfortunately, it's hard to predict who those people are without a trial of GLP-1 receptor agonist therapy. On average, they reduce systolic blood pressure, and they're not associated with any intrinsic risk of hypoglycemia. When combined with sulfonylureas or insulin, they do increase the hypoglycemic effect of sulfonylureas or insulin, but intrinsically, they're not associated with the risk of hypoglycemia, and therefore, there is no need for routine blood glucose monitoring in the setting of GLP-1 receptor agonist therapy. And for most of the agents, dosing is independent of meals or time of day. One of the challenges of using the GLP-1 receptor agonist class of medications is that there are a number of agents that are available, and selecting within the class in prescribing can be challenging. So one of the ways that we can distinguish members of the class is the frequency and route of administration. The original GLP-1 receptor agonist was exenatide in a twice-a-day formulation. The indication is to give it within 60 minutes before meals. The second agent available was liraglutide as a once-a-day injection that could be given at any time of the day. And more recently, we have another daily injection 
product called Lixi Senatide, which is delivered within 60 minutes before the first meal of the day. There is FDA approval for semaglutide that can be administered as a daily oral tablet. It must be given at least 30 minutes before the morning meal on an empty stomach with four ounces of water or less. And then we have several weekly injections, dulaglutide, a once-weekly formulation of exenatide, and semaglutide in its injection form. And these once-weekly injections can be given at any time of the day. We can also parse the GLP-1 receptor agonist family based on the recommendations around use in the setting of renal disease. Exenatide and lixicenatide are so-called xenopeptides. Xeno starts with an X, and you can remember that they're the xenopeptides because they have Xs in their name. The exenatide was first discovered, and the marketed product is functionally a salivary protein from lizard called a Gila monster. And this particular molecular structure isn't metabolized in the circulation and therefore has to be cleared renally. Lixicenatide is really an analog of exenatide and shares that characteristic. And therefore, in patients who have renal insufficiency, because these drugs are renally cleared, they need to be dosed with caution. So with exenatide, it should not be used or is not recommended with a creatinine clearance less than 30. With lixicenatide, not be used or not recommended with an EGFR less than 15. And with exenatide, once weekly, shouldn't be used or not recommended with an EGFR less than 45. There's a variety of cautions for the class in general, and the issues there are that these agents, because they are associated with nausea and sometimes vomiting and rarely prolonged episodes of vomiting, that patients with kidney disease who have decreased oral intake related to GI adverse events can develop dehydration and as a result of that, develop an acute kidney injury on the background of chronic kidney disease. So the issue is to ensure that patients drink plenty of fluids in the setting of chronic kidney disease, including when they're using GLP-1 receptor agonists, and certainly hold these medications and seek medical attention if they have prolonged episodes of nausea or vomiting or the inability to take in fluids. There are a number of novel and investigational GLP-1 receptor agonists. The first that I want to discuss is epiglenotide, a once-weekly subcutaneous injection. It has a novel structure with an FC-conjugated exendin molecule and the addition of mini polyethylene glycol. Dose-ranging studies have shown that it's as effective as liraglutide at the maximum diabetes dose of 1.8 milligrams a day with similar adverse event profile. And there is a cardiovascular outcome trial, Amplitude O, which is expected to be completed in April of 2021. There's also exenatide implanted mini pump. It's called ITCA, I-T-C-A 650. The currently studied and under FDA review formulation is a 90 to 180 day continuous subcutaneous infusion. There are investigations uh, ongoing with regards to potentially longer implants in the future. The dose-ranging studies show that the efficacy of the ITCA 650 is similar to exenatide twice daily with a similar adverse event profile and very high treatment satisfaction. It's currently undergoing FDA review. The cardiovascular outcome trials was completed in March of 2016. The press release suggests that there's non-inferiority versus placebo, but the data remains unpublished. Oral semaglutide is a once-daily oral tablet, a combination of semaglutide with an absorption enhancer. In dose-ranging studies, it's been shown that oral semaglutide in the doses recommended is basically as effective as the injected once-weekly formulation of semaglutide with a similar adverse event profile. There's also a cardiovascular outcome trial that's been started with estimated completion in July of 2024. So what factors should we consider in choosing between a GLP-1 receptor agonist and SGLT2 inhibitor? 
in the recommended guidelines and treatment recommendations, both of these agents are associated with cardiovascular benefits. Both of these agents are associated with renal benefits. Both of these agents have a low risk for hypoglycemia and are associated with good glycemic efficacy plus weight loss. How do we really distinguish when one is a better choice than the other? Well, I think there are situations where GLP-1 receptor agonists are clearly the better choice. The first would be when low EGFR is present. Currently, the marketed SGLT2 inhibitors are not indicated for use when an EGFR is less than 45. The cardiovascular outcome trials, and particularly the kidney outcome trials, they were used down to an EGFR of 30, and that certainly is a consideration for the FDA to adjudicate. GLP-1 receptor agonists may be the better choice when patients have problems with lower limb ulceration, foot ulcers, severe neuropathy. The rationale there is that in the CANVAS trial with canagliflozin, there was an increased risk of amputation. In the CREDENCE trial, there was evidence that if you excluded those patients from the trial and you took them off the SGLT2 inhibitor, if they developed a foot ulcer, that you could reduce the risk of amputation. So the SGLT2 inhibitor associated risk of amputation can be minimized. But I think in patients where foot ulcers or risk factors for foot ulcers is a major part of the patient's profile, GLP-1 receptor agonists are the better choice. In patients who at baseline have issues with genital urinary symptoms, particularly women who have struggled with vaginal yeast infections, or men, more often than women, but women as well, who at baseline are getting up several times a night to go to the bathroom, or who complain that even just driving around, their trips are often interrupted by the need to stop to avoid. In those patients, I think the GLP-1 receptor agonists are a better choice because there are no GU-associated symptoms. The GLP-1 receptor agonists, particularly the most effective of them, are clearly more effective in hemoglobin A1C lowering than SGLT2 inhibitors. So if you have a patient who's far away from their target, maybe a GLP-1 receptor agonist is the better choice. And shared decision-making is the key issue. And if a patient prefers it, I think in some ways that's almost more important than whether the doctor prefers it, as long as the patient clearly understands the risks and benefits of the decision that's being made. On the other hand, there are patients where SGLT2 inhibitors are clearly the better choice. I think in patients who have heart failure, particularly heart failure with reduced ejection fraction, or chronic kidney disease, particularly if the urine albumin to creatinine ratio is greater than 300, the SGLT2 inhibitor is associated with much stronger data providing benefits in those patients than GLP-1 receptor agonists. If people are bothered by chronic GI complaints or if they really have a GI disease, and most particularly if they had a prior history of pancreatitis, an SGLT2 inhibitor is a better choice. A personal or family history of MEN2 or medullary thyroid cancer is a contraindication for GLP-1 receptor agonist therapy, and in those patients, an SGLT2 inhibitor would be a better choice. And lastly, again, shared decision-making I do think is critical, and I do tend to work with patients to try and get them the drugs that they think are going to work best for them. Now we'll talk about the scientific background for GLP-1 receptor agonist therapy. There are many classes of glucose-lowering agents uh, for type 2 diabetes. We are mostly talking today about the GLP-1 receptor agonists, and sometimes there's some confusion about how they're similar and how they're different from DPP-4 inhibitors. Also, because the GLP-1 receptor agonists are generally injected, there has been some confusion about how they're similar and how they're different from insulin. The good news is that they can be combined and are fully additive with regards to glucose-lowering effects in combination with metformin, the biguanide metformin, sulfonylureas, thiazoldinediones, and SGLT2 inhibitors. 
Because GLP-1 receptor agonists are often injected and basal insulins are always injected, there's often some confusion about the differences. The GLP-1 receptor agonists as a class are as effective glucose-lowering agents, arguably more effective than basal insulin, but they do so without hypoglycemia and without weight gain. In fact, they promote weight loss, whereas insulin, as you know, is associated with hypoglycemia and weight gain. So that's the reason why the GLP-1 receptor agonists are preferred in advance of basal insulin in most patients with type 2 diabetes that requires the additional efficacy that these two most effective classes of medication are associated with. The GLP-1 receptor agonists and the DPP-4 inhibitors both involve the incretin system. So DPP-4 is the enzyme that breaks down the human body's produced GLP-1. So they are associated with a doubling of the GLP-1 activity in the bloodstream at any given time. The GLP-1 receptor agonists provide for much more GLP-1 in the circulation than we achieve with DPP-4 inhibitors. As a result of that, they are more effective glucose-lowering agents they are associated with reduced cardiovascular risk, whereas the DPP-4 inhibitors to date haven't been, and they promote weight loss, whereas the DPP-4 inhibitors are generally weight neutral. So it is correct to say that GLP-1 receptor agonists and DPP-4 inhibitors are both affecting incretin biology, but the more you can keep them apart in your mind, the better you can understand the benefits of the two classes separately. So the mechanism of action of the incretin therapies is dependent on the level of GLP-1 achieved in the circulation. With increasing plasma GLP-1 concentrations, different organ systems are affected. At relatively low levels of GLP-1, so-called physiologic GLP-1 levels, we have insulin secretion enhanced and a reduction in glucagon secretion, particularly in the postprandial state, resulting in a decrease in plasma glucose. And that level of GLP-1 is achieved by DPP-4 inhibitors and far exceeded by GLP-1 receptor agonists. As the levels get higher in the stomach, we have a reduction in gastric emptying. And as the GLP-1 levels get higher still, we have effects in the brain to reduce appetite and reduce food intake that results in weight loss. And lastly, at very high levels, you can have intestinal effects and central effects to promote nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, and abdominal pain. So these higher levels of exposure are only achieved by GLP-1 receptor agonists, and that's why they're associated with weight loss increased glycemic efficacy, but sometimes nausea and other GI adverse effects, whereas the DPP-4 inhibitors provide for more modest glucose-lowering effect, in general, little or no weight loss, and in general, good GI tolerability. The GLP-1 receptor agonists have broad activity. So we think about their indication for glucose-lowering in the setting of type 2 diabetes, that's based on effects on the beta cell in pancreatic islets of Langerhans to increase insulin secretion and on the alpha cell to reduce glucose secretion. But there are much broader effects in the brain, effects on appetite that res result in decreases in body weight, in the blood vessel, effects to lower blood pressure, in the kidney to promote sodium excretion and diuresis, in the platelets to reduce hypercoagulability, in the intestine to reduce postprandial lipid exposure, and in variety of tissues, in fat in particular, but basically all the tissues, an effect to reduce inflammation. Many of those factors might actually be mechanisms that result in cardioprotection as well, but there are details that have been worked out in the heart to demonstrate the effects that we've just discussed, but also in experimental models, reduced ischemic injury, improved LV function, an increase in heart rate. And in the vascular endothelium, an improvement in vasodilatation and plaque stability.
exactly what the mechanism is by which GLP-1 receptor agonists promote cardiovascular health, reduce rates of heart attack, stroke, and often cardiovascular death. What that mechanism is unclear, but there are many potential pathways to explain the cardiovascular benefits of GLP-1 receptor agonists. The cardiovascular outcome trials, of which there now have been seven published, have shown that the GLP-1 receptor agonists are at least safe and in many cases associated with cardiovascular benefits. One of the benefits that have been demonstrated in the trials is reductions in hemoglobin A1c. That ranges in the trials from around 0.3% for lixicenotide to up to 1.1% in the 1 milligram dose of semaglutide. These aren't the best trials to evaluate the glycemic efficacy of these drugs because in the placebo arm and in the GLP-1 receptor agonist arm, additional diabetes medications could be added or subtracted. I've mentioned before, the GLP-1 receptor agonists are extremely effective glucose-lowering agents. They do so without promoting hypoglycemia. And when you look at the cardiovascular outcome trials, in general, the rates of severe hypoglycemia are similar between the patients randomized to exenatide or other GLP-1 receptor agonists. Despite this great efficacy, rates of severe hypoglycemia in the GLP-1 receptor agonist cardiovascular outcome trials have been quite low and comparable between treatment and placebo in these blinded studies. In general, the hypoglycemia that does occur in the setting of GLP-1 receptor agonists are in patients who are treated with insulin or sulfonylurea at baseline. With regards to MACE, or major adverse cardiovascular endpoints, generally MI, stroke, and cardiovascular death, sometimes with the addition of unstable angina, most of the studies have demonstrated a point estimate of the hazard ratio less than one that suggests that the GLP-1 receptor agonists is associated with fewer MACE events than placebo therapy. The one exception is the ALEXA trial with lixicenotide. Whether that's because this is relatively short-acting GLP-1 receptor agonist that's only administered once a day, so it doesn't provide 24-hour coverage, or whether that's related to differences in the conduct of the trial where these patients all had recent history of acute coronary syndrome and the primary endpoint was a four-point composite, we don't know. The only GLP-1 receptor agonist that has an FDA-approved indication for reducing MACE endpoints is liraglutide. There have been filings or will soon be filings for exenatide, once-weekly dulaglutide, semaglutide, and probably oral semaglutide as well. The big excitement around the GLP-1 receptor agonists is that some of these agents have been shown to reduce MACE events in patients with type 2 diabetes at high cardiovascular risk. As you can see, the patients that were randomized in these trials included a spectrum of patients from people with acute coronary syndrome in the ELIXA trial to patients with prior atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease to a mixture of patients with prior disease and symptoms of disease and even just risk factors for disease. The primary endpoint for most was cardiovascular death, MI, and stroke in the ELIXA trial, also unstable angina. In each of the trials, the point estimate for the hazard ratio for the primary endpoint was less than one, except for ELIXA. And we don't know whether ELIXA was a negative result, though it proved the safety of lixicenotide. It didn't suggest any efficacy. And was that trial negative because of a difference in the drug or a difference in the population or a difference in the endpoint? We don't know. But the other trials all have suggested benefits with regards to cardiovascular outcomes. A second area of excitement from the cardiovascular outcome trials with the GLP-1 receptor agonists has been some evidence for a reduction of progression of nephropathy. These were always secondary endpoints in the cardiovascular outcome trials, 
In general, the trials demonstrated no increase, often a, at least a numerical decrease in acute kidney injury. In general, often quite strong signals on reductions of albuminuria and macroalbuminuria. And in some trials, a suggestion of benefit with regards to harder renal outcomes as well. The ADA and ESD in reviewing these data suggests that GLP-1 receptor agonists could be considered in the setting of chronic kidney disease. The SGLT-2 inhibitors do provide a stronger record of reducing more advanced renal outcomes and would be preferred in that population. I think the most exciting endpoint that has been explored in these trials has been all-cause and cardiovascular mortality. The cardiovascular mortality is obviously part or a component of the composite MACE primary endpoint, but these trials have remarkably, in some cases, demonstrated improvements in cardiovascular death, specifically the LEADER trial with liraglutide and the PIONEER-6 trial with oral semaglutide. Also, in the EXCEL trial, an improvement in all-cause death. But as you look across the trials, in general, the point estimate for the hazard ratio is less than one. And I think this gives us great confidence with regards to the safety and the net benefit of treatment with the drug. So when we are engaged in shared decision-making, I find that patients find it very compelling to be able to talk about the adverse effects of the drug in the context of improvements or potential improvements in mortality. It turns out that 1 in 10,000 risk of a rare event that's then doubled, let's say, as a possibility with a drug that has very little potential for impact in a patient's life whereas an improvement in the near-term risk of cardiovascular all-cause mortality is quite easy to understand on the benefit side. In a recent meta-analysis of the cardiovascular outcome trials published to date, seven of them, when looking at renal outcomes, the components of the composite outcome, all-cause death and hospitalization for heart failure, you can see that across the trials, there is substantial benefits in renal outcomes, non-fatal stroke, MACE, cardiovascular death, all-cause death, and hospitalized heart failure. This will differ from trial to trial, and it's a little bit unclear whether that's related to meaningful differences between the agents or whether it's the play of chance. I do think that the strong signal for benefits across these broad endpoints, across seven different studies, gives us great confidence, again, about the net benefit of therapy with GLP-1 receptor agonists in patients at high risk for cardiovascular disease. So now we'll turn our attention to shared decision-making and how to enhance that in patients where you're considering using GLP-1 receptor agonists. The recent ADA guidelines, which were jointly developed with the European Association for the Study of Diabetes, focus first and foremost on putting the patient at the center of care and shared decision-making as the central tenant of clinical care decisions. This framing is based on the notion that we need to assess patient characteristics and consider individual factors that may impact the choice of treatment, and then engage patients in a shared decision-making process to create a management plan. Only once a patient agrees to a management plan, they fully bought in, they understand the rationale, they agree that this is a treatment that they can actually do, that we work towards implementing a management plan with routine monitoring, support, and review and reformulation, agreeing on a future management plan again. So this is a cycle of care, but the key nexus is the shared decision-making with the patient and the provider to create a management plan that is doable and desirable for the patient. The VA and the Department of Defense, in their clinical practice guidelines, also emphasize shared decision-making, and they suggest the acronym SHARE. I like this very much. Seek your patient's participation. 
help your patient explore and compare and understand treatment options, assess your patient's values and preferences, and reach a decision with your patient, making sure that the patient is not only involved, but clearly engaged that he or she is going to be doing 99.9% of the behaviors associated with this decision. And then lastly, evaluate your patient's decision and reevaluating it in an ongoing process of care. In talking to patients who might be hesitant in using an injectable GLP-1 receptor agonist, I think there are a variety of factors that are important to review. And frankly, I think this whole process of thinking about how you would address these issues with your patient may increase even your level of comfort with regards to using these injectable GLP-1 receptor agonists. So first, with regards to injections, today's needles are really tiny. You know, for most people over the age of 65, they have to take off their glasses to even see them. In some devices, the dulaglutide device in particular, the needle is invisible within the pen, and it's just released under the patient's skin when the button on the pen at the top is triggered. But in any case, these devices really are essentially painless. The injections are subcutaneous, not intramuscular. I think many children are scarred by their intramuscular injections as infants, and they hold those adverse experiences in their brain throughout life. So it's very important to explain to patients that these are not like the immunizations that they got as a child, or even the blood draws that they may have had earlier in life. These GLP-1 receptor pens are pre-filled. There is no reason to carry around syringes or bottles, and this makes it not only more convenient, but sort of more acceptable in the community if people are observed using their medications. GLP-1 receptors, most importantly, may prevent cardiac adverse events in patients at high risk for cardiovascular disease, And though there is labeling information about cancers, the best evidence in humans is that they don't cause cancer. And it's important to put it into perspective. Patients with diabetes generally die of heart attack, stroke, and other cardiovascular disorders. And that's where the benefit is. There is no signal for an increased risk of cancer. And frankly, people are at lower risk of cancer than cardiovascular death. The GLP-1 receptor agonists mostly can be taken at any time of the day, so it's something they should be able to do discreetly at home. They're not going to have to carry their injection kit with them 24 hours a day. And lastly, blood glucose monitoring is not routinely required. Patients may want to monitor their blood sugars, but frankly, the GLP-1 receptor agonists are very effective, and many patients can get by without monitoring at all. There's no reason to monitor for safety because these drugs are not associated with hypoglycemia unless combined with the sulfonylurea or insulin, but in that setting, they're monitoring in any case. All the GLP-1 receptor agonists are indicated as an adjunct to diet and exercise to improve glycemic control in adults with type 2 diabetes. Liraglutide is the only agent currently indicated for use in children they completed that trial relatively recently. With regards to reduction of cardiovascular endpoints, liraglutide is the only agent with current approval. Other agents are having their prescribing information reviewed with the FDA, and we may hear more soon. With regards to reduction of MACE endpoints, heart attack, stroke, and cardiovascular disease in patients with type 2 diabetes and established cardiovascular disease, we have data from multiple clinical trials and approvals from several agents with regards to cardiovascular risk reduction. In the future, there may be more. It is important to recognize that many patients don't see themselves as being at increased risk for cardiovascular disease. In surveys where patients with type 2 diabetes were asked questions about what things they thought they were at increased risk of, they understand death, amputation, and blindness quite well. 
surprisingly kidney disease numerically to a greater extent than cardiovascular disease, and then many other factors are even less well understood. But importantly, a quarter of patients don't understand that they're at increased risk for cardiovascular disease, and that's an important point for patient education. In a specific survey of 212 adults, they poorly understood the link between cholesterol and heart disease. They generally had a lack of knowledge of cardiovascular risk factors, and they had very low awareness of exercises and techniques for reducing cardiovascular risk in the setting of diabetes. In the prescribing information for GLP-1 receptor agonists, there are a whole series of warnings and precautions. To take them in order, thyroid C-cell tumors are clearly a problem for rodents, but not for humans in the setting of GLP-1 receptor agonist therapy. There is no evidence of any increased risk of medullary thyroid cancer with GLP-1 receptor agonists in humans. The short-acting agents are not labeled in this regard because they don't provide 24-hour exposure. The longer-acting agents are labeled in this regard. But again, as far as I'm concerned, the risk is essentially theoretical. With regards to pancreatitis, all the agents are associated with labeling for acute pancreatitis. In these cardiovascular outcome trials, in the meta-analyses with over 50,000 patients exposed, generally with two to five year and sometimes longer exposure, the point estimate of the hazard ratio for risk of pancreatitis is essentially one. So I think the best evidence is that pancreatitis is a problem for people with diabetes, but it's unclear that there's any increased risk with GLP-1 receptor agonists. Acute gallbladder disease popped up in the LEADER trial. The full publication is available if you want to examine it. We know that drugs that are associated with weight loss can be associated with increased risk of gallbladder disease, cholecystitis, the need for cholecystectomy. I suspect that's the mechanism. There is some evidence to suggest that these agents may slow or reduce contractility in the biliary system, and maybe that's another contributor. It's not a big problem, but it probably is a problem for the class. The only labeling is currently in exenatide once weekly in loraglutide. Acute kidney injury can come about because of nausea, vomiting, dehydration, particularly in the setting of chronic kidney disease. So I always tell all patients to drink plenty of fluids, and if they have nausea, vomiting, or develop dehydration for a period of more than a few hours to hold the drug until their nausea or vomiting goes away, and if it persists for more than 12 hours, they may need to seek medical attention. The short-acting agents that are based on the exenatide structure are generally contraindicated in the setting of severe renal impairment or end-stage renal disease because they're cleared renally. All the agents can increase the risk of hypoglycemia if used with sulfonylurea or insulin. So my practice is in patients whose A1C is less than 8 or in patients who already have problems with hypoglycemia in the context of sulfonylurea or insulin therapy. When I start one of these agents, I generally reduce or stop their sulfonylurea or insulin being very cautious, again, that some people with adult-onset diabetes have type 1 diabetes, and you cannot stop insulin in those patients. Anaphylaxis and hypersensitivity reactions have been reported with virtually every drug on the planet. Immunogenicity is an issue for exenatide and lixicenatide, as they are xenopeptides, again, derived from the saliva of a Gila monster, and therefore they are more immunogenic than the other agents. Severe gastrointestinal disease is a relative contraindication for the use of these GLP-1 receptor agonists because of problems with nausea and vomiting as an adverse effect of therapy. Semaglutide has labeling around diabetic retinopathy, probably because it is so effective in glucose lowering that it caused an acceleration of retinopathy and very poorly controlled patients probably had retinopathy at baseline. This has similarly been demonstrated for insulin. Injection site nodules are a specific issue with exenatide once weekly, 
And as is true for any injected medication, we shouldn't have patients sharing devices that have been exposed to blood because of the risk of transmission of diseases. I think all these warnings and precautions are quite reasonable. I think the important context is these drugs in patients at high risk for cardiovascular disease are associated with improvements in heart attack, stroke, and in some cases, mortality. These are all sort of theoretical or relatively uncommon risks, and they need to be put in context. Clearly, for patients at high risk for cardiovascular disease, I think the net benefit is substantial. In thinking about the therapeutic characteristics of GLP-1 receptor agonists, some of these can be inferred from their structure. So with regards to pharmacokinetics, we have short-acting agents and long-acting agents. The short-acting agents, exenatide twice a day and lixicenatide, have much stronger effects on gastric emptying. So in general, not as good GI tolerability, but much better effects to lower postprandial glucose, arguably the best postprandial glucose lowering drugs on the planet. Because they don't have enough duration of action to last until the morning, they tend to have less effect on fasting plasma glucose and hemoglobin A1C. With regards to structure, there are three marketed products that are based on the Xendin-4 structure. That's a salivary peptide from a Gila monster. You can think of that as a xenopeptide, and they contain X in their name, xenotide and lixicenotide. These xenogenic agents have more issues with immune responses and because they are not cleaved by DPP-4, they're not metabolized in the circulation, they tend to accumulate in patients with advanced renal disease, and there are more issues and more labeling around renal disease for the Xendin-4 based molecules. And then lastly, with regards to molecular size, the small ones tend to get into the brain better, the large ones less. This was true with dulaglutide, where you get somewhat less of the central effects, particularly weight loss with these very large molecules. When you look at the efficacy of GLP-1 receptor agonists, in general, these agents are all quite effective. With regards to weight, there are some differences. The most effective weight loss in type 2 diabetes in trials has been demonstrated with semaglutide, particularly at the 1 milligram dose, where weight loss on the order of 5 plus kilograms can be expected. As was mentioned earlier, dulaglutide as a larger peptide doesn't penetrate the brain as much, or at least that's the theory, and may be associated with somewhat less weight loss than some of the other agents. But in general, the response from individual to individual is quite broad, and some patients respond more remarkably to these drugs with regards to weight loss, and as you can see, some respond little at all. With regard to systolic blood pressure, I think there's more variation by random chance between these trials than can be explained pharmacologically. In general, as a class, these agents are associated with modest blood pressure reduction. The short-acting agent, exenatide, twice a day, has more nausea as a result of it having a greater effect on gastric emptying because it doesn't provide 24-hour coverage. The agents with 24-hour coverage, in general, you have tachyphylaxis to the GI adverse effects and therefore less GI distress. But in general, there's substantial variation from individual to individual. The good news is at most a third to half of the patients have any GI adverse effects at all. And so I think the important discussion with patients is, you know, we just have to try to see. And if you start with a low dose and advance the dose slowly, back off when patients have GI adverse effects, most patients can get through the GI tolerability issues. So when we look at medication adherence, which arguably is the most important aim of the patient-provider interaction. You know, we can't get these drugs with remarkable effects to provide benefits unless patients take them. We can divide the barriers into four categories, each of which have multiple root causes. There are information barriers, there's problems with personal motivation, 
There's issues with social motivation. And then there's issues around behavioral skills in being able to take medications. Each of these is critically important, and to the extent that in shared decision-making, we can identify the barriers and then address them, the plan is to have a better effect on enhancing diabetes medication adherence. So with regards to the information barriers, there are some patients who believe that brand-name medications work better than generics. I think that can be true for some drugs. I think, in general, the generics work quite well. And if a generic even works 90% or 80% as well, but at one-tenth the cost, it's a bargain nevertheless. So I tend to use generics quite widely. I think metformin is a drug where as you go from one generic formulation to another, there can be big issues in tolerability. So encouraging patients to stick with one brand of generic sometimes can result in better outcomes. Many patients expect immediate improvement. In some classes of drugs, that's possible. In others, it's not. I do think it's really critical through shared decision-making for patients to understand what you're expecting the medication to do. As an example, with GLP-1 receptor agonists, a reduction in fasting glucose, a reduction in hemoglobin A1c, a reduction in weight, perhaps a reduction in blood pressure, but most importantly, with long-term use in patients at high risk for cardiovascular disease, reducing the risk of heart attack, stroke, and cardiovascular death in some cases. It's important for people to know the big plan, not just I'm supposed to take a medicine for my diabetes. And often patients are just not understanding why the rationale for making different changes in medication doses. The personal motivation barriers are harder to deal with and a completely different set of issues, but many patients are burned out from having diabetes, having to worry about diet exercise in addition to medication. They worry about long-term side effects. They worry about side effects in general. They may think that the medication is associated with harms or that treatment is futile. I think these can be addressed, particularly in the setting of GLP-1 receptor agonists, because we have these long-term studies on clinically meaningful endpoints like heart attack, stroke, and death. And then social motivational barriers are arguably the biggest or the most difficult problems to address. Many patients have competing responsibilities. They're working multiple jobs to be able to afford their medications, that their family members are maybe not being as supportive as they could be. Nagging and social support are a little bit different. Embarrassment about taking injections, embarrassment about taking medications or admitting to their diabetes. Addressing these issues can often help. And then behavioral skills, another huge problem. Many patients just forget to take their medicines. I have to admit, I do. I can reduce my forgetfulness about taking medications by using a pill box where I can look at the box and see, oh, it's Tuesday. I didn't take my medicines this morning. Maybe I should take them right now. Injection pain, I think, is easy to address. We've discussed about it before. Paying for medicines is a serious issue. It really needs to be addressed. There are inexpensive medications that are available, and there are ways to get the more expensive medications in a more affordable way. I think addressing all these issues with patients as part of the shared decision-making process is really critical to medication adherence, which is really the most critical step to achieving the A1C goals that we're aiming for. There are some studies where the GLP-1 receptor agonists have been compared to other agents and evaluated with regards to patient satisfaction. In this publication, they went further in breaking down patient satisfaction in patients who did have GI adverse effects, one or more episodes of nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, other GI side effects, or those patients who had not a single GI adverse effect throughout the conduct of the trial. I think there's several things to notice here. One is, in general, more patients never had any GI side effects. The numbers at the top of the columns are all higher in the sections of the graph without GI adverse effects. When you look at low-dose semaglutide versus high-dose semaglutide, the light blue bar versus the blue bar, there is an enhancement of patient satisfaction in general. When you look at patient satisfaction comparing semaglutide to dulaglutide in the SUSTAIN-7 study, very similar patient satisfaction. 
in Sustain 3, where the comparison is against the xenotide once weekly, we see in general greater patient satisfaction. It's unclear why in these studies, but that may be related to the greater efficacy of semaglutide or the lack of injection nodules or the less difficult and challenging preparation. And then in SUSTAIN-5, in comparison to placebo, on the background of insulin therapy, substantially greater patient satisfaction in patients taking semaglutide as compared to placebo. So in general, because of the great efficacy of these drugs, because of their effect to promote weight loss, despite the fact that there's injections and despite the fact that some people have GI adverse effects, in general, patients are happy with the drugs. With regards to persistence, it varies a bit by the particular agent that's prescribed. These are extremely complicated dynamics based on marketing, based on insurance coverage and changing formularies and pharmacy benefits. The details of how the drug is actually delivered, I do think dulaglutide has a really remarkable device. The needle is hidden within the device. The patient doesn't see the needle. The experience of giving an injection is, you know, though it does involve a needle stick because the patient doesn't see it and fundamentally hardly anybody feels it, it's a great presentation. These other agents are similarly quite easy to use. I think the important point is that there are patient problems with persistence over time and shared decision-making and support to help patients overcome barriers to be able to continue on the drugs is important. And lastly, it's very important how patients respond early on in the course of therapy to persistence. I think this is true for all drugs, but with regards to the GLP-1 receptor agonists, we have data. So here you look at the patients who had an early A1C response, meaning a greater than 1% reduction in A1C they were 59% more likely to stay on the GLP-1 receptor agonist. If they had an early weight response defined as at least a 3% loss in weight, so that's on the order of 5 to 10 pounds in most adults, they were 18% more likely to stay on the therapy. And for those who had both an early A1C response and an early weight response, so about 15% of the population, they were 64% more likely to stay on a GLP-1 receptor agonist. There's two sides to this information that we need to keep in mind. One is that if people have a good response, they're more likely to persist. But also, if you are using the drug to reduce cardiovascular events in patients at high risk for cardiovascular disease, you may need to address these issues that, okay, we didn't get an A1C reduction of more than 1%, but we got 0.7%. That's pretty good. We didn't get the 10 pounds weight loss that we were hoping for, but we got 5 pounds weight loss. That's pretty good. Keep your eye on the prize. What we're really trying to do is reduce the risk of heart attack, stroke, and cardiovascular death. So thank you very much for your attention. This activity has been jointly provided by Medical Learning Institute, Incorporated, and PVI, Peerview Institute for Medical Education.